I love that on this show, I can bring you absolutely amazing conversion stories from absolutely incredible Christians who, who find solace, who find their destination uh, from their faith trajectory in the Catholic Church. And this episode... <laughs> Is simply mind blowing. First of all, because I met this guest like two seconds before I hit record. It happened to be a friend, uh, Chris, who introduced us um, for for future guests on the show. And I had a current guest I'm in here in the studio waiting for not show up. And I said, "Hey, hey, Philip, are you are you free now?" And he was. And I got to think that the Holy Spirit orchestrated this all along. It was it was just too good to be true. And then I heard his story. This story unfolded, and it was simply amazing. And what I love about it, first of all, is that it, it mirrors my story in many cases as a Protestant Pentecostal Christian finding the Catholic Church and loving this faith. But also because his way of talking about his trajectory, his conversion story, is exactly how I feel and try to articulate on this show week after week. Not that I'm anti-evangelical. I'm anti-Pentecostal. That the past that I was is all wrong, and I've turned from that and left that and become Catholic. Not at all. Like Philip, I find that that in my past prepared me, set the table, got me ready to, to just dig deeper. Right? It was those questions that I encountered, that Philip encountered reading his Bible thoroughly and deeply to let him to look deeper into what the, what the ancient church believed, what did the early church fathers believe, what it was believed in, in history, and who else believes that now? And they go, oh, it's the Catholics, the Catholics. It's these kind of discoveries that, that our Pentecostal, our Protestant, our evangelical past uh, prepared us to ask those questions and find those deep answers and find we believe now in Christ in the Eucharist, with the, with the saints and sacramental confession, the sacraments, the apostolic church. Those things drew us, drew us deeper because we have a bedrock of that faith to begin with. Not a turning away from Pentecostalism, but a deepening. That's, I think, where we're going here. It's an amazing story. Philip is a fantastic guest. I think you'll love this. Let me know in the comments below, guys. Please interact. Tell me what you think. But I think it's about to blow your mind. It certainly blew mine. Please enjoy. Hey friends, welcome to the show. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you're listening on podcasts, on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, please leave a rating or review that helps to push the podcast out to more listeners who will hear conversations like this fantastic one we are about to have. And if you're watching on YouTube, thank you. Make sure to subscribe to the channel, hit the bell to notify when new videos come out each and every week. And please do interact below uh, in the comments, guys. That would be fantastic. Uh, this is uh, a truly uh, providential episode, I think interview. Um, I am joined, I'll tell you why in a second here. I'm joined by uh, Philip Campbell. He's the author of several books, including Story of the Church, a four-volume story of, in uh, sorry, in the four-volume Story of Civilization series. He's the editor of a number of books um, and has written The Church and the Dark Ages uh, in the series, in the Reclaiming Catholic History series from Ave Maria Press, a fantastic series. He's an instructor uh, for Homeschool Connections, uh, lives in Southern Michigan, and is a convert to the Catholic faith. Philip, thanks for being here. Welcome to the show, and hello. Thanks, Keith. I'm very glad to be on this show that I just learned about <laughs> <laughs> moments ago. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. Let me let, 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 let the listener, the audience, in uh, in on a behind yeah, the yeah, scenes yeah. here. Yeah. So I, I'm sitting here in my studio waiting for a guest to appear, and the, t the clock is ticking away, and he hasn't appeared yet. And I was speaking earlier in the day to our mutual friend, Chris, who let me know this guy named Philip, who I should interview. And I looked you up on your bio. I have a couple of your books here in my library. I thought, this, this is fantastic. And just so happens as I'm sitting down here waiting for my guest to appear, he connects us on a Facebook Messenger conversation. And uh, and I, I cheekily say, hey, are you, are you busy right now? My, my guest is a no-show. And it turns out you weren't, you weren't busy. <laughs> <As it's> yeah, <laughs> we've literally known each other for like nine minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is fantastic. So I, I got to think, Philip, that this is some sort of divine intervention happening here. We could I be hope. wrong. It could be a terrible episode. <laughs> episode. could just crash and burn. Oh, my gosh. But, but I have a feeling, and actually, I, I was saying this to somebody I was talking to earlier in the day. 
because I had uh, um, Dr. Scott Hahn, the illustrious Dr. Scott Hahn, had to postpone next week's interview uh, to later in the year. Um, he got a cold. So I was saying to a guest that was filling in for him on my calendar next week, I said, you know, when these things happen, when, when guests cancel and somebody kind of just pops in, those are always the, the best interviews because that's really, I'm, I'm out of the way and the schedule just kind of makes itself. But never before have I had the schedule make itself like this much on the fly that literally, you just, <laughs> I've known you for nine seconds and you, you pop in and we begin this thing. So uh, I hope you aren't an ax murderer. I don't think that you are. Uh, I'm safely over here though. So yeah, I, I have a ways to go. You're a couple hours away from where I am here. So I, I have a running start. And I'm on uh, vacation if, if right now. I'm on vacation right now in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I'm oh, pretty oh. far away from you at the moment. So miles away. Miles yeah, yeah. Away. A long time away. Yeah. That's fantastic. Okay. Well, um, I understand from meeting you nine seconds ago, uh, Philip, that you have an interesting conversion story. This show is geared towards, you know, converts to the Catholic faith, those looking yeah. into the Catholic faith. Uh, not to say, hey, you guys are all morons and wrong. You should become Catholic because you're stupid. Uh, right. That's not the <laughs> not the angle here. But but it's that idea of finding that pearl of great price, right? Mm -hmm. Buried in that field and selling everything and just going and, and digging that up in that field. That's what I feel like we find as converts. It's our love for Scripture, our love for, for the Bible, our love for Christ that draws us deeper into something else. And you come across Catholicism and you, you go, wow. So I will just get out of the way. I'll let you kind of unpack your story, how you want to unpack your story. Yeah. I'll, I'll jump in along the way if there's things we can unpack and, and we'll listen. And I'm excited to hear uh, sure. more about you because this this is a very brand new friendship, Philip, and I, we'll, we'll, ah. see where, we'll see where, what I can learn about you. Well, thanks, Keith. Um, yeah, uh, I uh, I often struggle. What, so, well, first of all, let me just thank you because I normally I do a lot of interviews, but it's normally like history related or about my books, and I don't yeah, often yeah, get to yeah. talk about my conversion story. So, this is really excellent uh, opportunity for me. Um, so, thank you for making it available. Um, I've always struggled whether you know whether I should define myself as a convert or not. I definitely had a conversion experience that uh, I I tend to think of myself as a convert. Um, canonically, I don't know if I was because I was actually baptized Catholic as a child. Um, I came from a family that was, uh, like at very ethnically Catholic, like on my father's side, we were Sicilians and we were still recent enough where like my grandma spoke Sicilian, you know, and, uh, on <laughs> my, on my mother's side, it was like po very heavily Polish, you know, and, uh, my grandfather had actually converted to Catholicism to marry my grandmother. Um, cause she was, uh, she was Polish. So I was like Polish Sicilian. I had some Irish in there. It was just like a very ethnic Catholic, you know, and, uh, grew up in Southeastern Michigan where there was a lot of ethnic Catholic communities, you know, like, uh, uh, in like the Detroit area, you had like your, your Polish neighborhoods and your Czech yeah, and your yeah. Italian. And so I came out of that, that milieu where when I went to my family reunions, there was like, Hey, yeah, about it. you know, like it was very, <laughs> very Italian, you know? Um, so just kind of like as a matter of course, I was baptized uh, as an infant, you know, but um, nobody in my family was practicing. My my grandma hadn't been to confession since like 1940. Um, <laughs> no, nobody in my 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 mom's side of the family had stopped practicing after Vatican II, um, basically. And so I didn't even so I was baptized Catholic, but I didn't even know I was Catholic, you know, when yeah, I was yeah, growing up. Yeah. I never went to mass. I never made a first communion. Um, my mom had a crucifix hanging on the wall in my house. So I knew like who Jesus was kind of um, just by like cultural osmosis, you know. Um, but it's not like I had any form of like religious instruction from my parents. Uh, I just had a secular upbringing as far as I can tell. I didn't consider myself a Christian. Uh, once I knew, I, I mean, obviously we celebrated the holidays and, and whatnot, you know, um, as, as most Americans do, but I just went to, I had a pretty normal public school, you know, secular upbringing in the eighties and then in the, the early nineties. Right. And I think my mom, my mom had been a practicing Catholic when she was little. I think she felt bad that I wasn't getting religious upbringing because every now and then she'd try to like introduce some religion into my life, but she didn't know how to. 
you know, so when I was a child, every now and then she'd give me a book like, oh, here's like the real meaning of Christmas or, yeah. you know, or, so, or sometimes when I was 10, she'd just randomly be like, you're going to vacation Bible school for the summer. And she just sent me to the assemblies of God or whatever, you know, random, whatever Christian denomination was doing, whatever program was like, I remember for preschool, I went to the local Methodist church for preschool, you know? Uh, so it was like, my mom had this sense of like, she felt like I should have religion, but like never talked to me about it and didn't yeah, know, yeah. um, how to introduce it into my life. Really? That I mean, that's my sense at least. So, but at any rate, I grew up with no religion whatsoever. Um, but I always, uh, you know, I felt like I was always, this phrase is a little stupid, but I've always felt like I was spiritually sensitive. Like I never in my life believed that there was no higher being. Um, so I was never an atheist. Um, even when I was just secular, I kind of had a vague sense that there was a God or some entity behind everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I was when I was uh, kind of like a younger teenager, I kind of got into paganism a bit. Um, I I bought like I bought like New Age books and uh, got into like witchcraft and stuff uh, because it catered to the transcendent aspect of yeah, yeah. man's existence. Uh, and I didn't I didn't get into the uh, so so back at this point, like we hadn't gotten to like this the real sappy New Age stuff yet, like the like the let's do yoga New Age. It was more like uh, it was more like sinister. It was more like the the let's contact spirits new yeah, age, yeah, yeah. Um, which ironically I say was more sinister, but it was also more legit, like more serious. Like if you're going to bother doing new age spirituality, <laughs> you know, like this was the one that actually believed that there were transcendent spiritual realities, yeah, yeah. not just kind of like a fake veneer to just talk about discovering yourself. You know what I mean? So this wasn't like the soccer mom Starbucks new age spirituality. <laughs> this was like the, you know, the, uh, the, the actual like, yes, there's spirits and I want to contact them, you know? So I got into that, uh, quite a bit and I became, uh, I became very, you know, obviously you get into that sort of stuff, you're going to get darkened, you know, and I got very darkened. I developed, uh, bad habits. I developed, uh, self-harm habits, you know, of like cutting myself with razor blades and, uh, I listened to death metal and, you know, I was very depressed. I, I just kind of brooded a lot and, and was very, very down on, on myself and down on life. And I think I was probably swarming with, you know, unwholesome spiritual activity. Um, and that's how I was going into high school. And then when I got into high school and I had all sorts of other bad, you know, uh, bad habits and whatnot, I, you know, I did the normal um, drugs and you know, everything that, everything that parents don't want their kids to do, yeah. you know, um, I never, I never went to jail, thankfully, but I could have many times. Um, I did, uh, I did get arrested once, but, um, so I was just kind of living a bad life. Um, uh, and, um, not very happy, you know, I was very much in like an existential sort of dread of just, I don't know, uh, not being very fulfilled or not knowing what my life was about. Well, when I was in high school, I met some Christians, um, through my friend group. I met, I had a friend named John that I met who was like a Pentecostal from the assemblies of God. And, um, he started telling me about Jesus, you know, and he even invited me to his church. And I, I remember I was like 15 and I went to his church and it was, a. Uh, it was very hokey, uh, Keith. This was like 1994, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and so yeah. we're going to like 1994 Assemblies of God. There's like the praise band up there. And uh, I, I played guitar a little bit. So he's like, do you want to join the praise band? And I was like, sure, I guess. So I got up there <laughs> and they hand me the they hand me the chord sheets, you know, and I'm sitting up there playing. I'm, I'm like a new age guy that's like into like witchcraft and stuff. And I'm sitting there playing like... Um, uh, what's the song? Like, it's a great big house with lots and lots of yes. rooms, you know, like I'm playing these songs, you know, and they're so hokey. Um, and I just, you know, I didn't even know what this, any of this was, but you know, something kind of tugged on me a little bit. Like I, it, I felt like there was a substance behind it. Um, there was like a real antagonism and, um, anyhow, I kind of like flirted with Christianity throughout my high school years where sometimes I'd 
I'd still be doing whatever I wanted to, but then sometimes I'd just kind of pray to God, like as a backup, I guess, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to kind of help me. Like if I was really in trouble, um, I ran away from home a couple times and I remember praying to God, like the God of Christianity when, you know, I really was like these pagans you read about in history where they're like in a battle and they're like going through all the like, I'm going to pray to <laughs> Thor and then this one. And then uh, God of the Christians, if you can hear me, maybe you can help also, you know, yeah, just kind of just in case you're yeah. real, you know? <laughs> um, well, by the time I had reached like my late teenage years, I'd graduated high school. Um, I was just come very, very empty. And uh, I'd, I'd kind of like given up on the paganism stuff, but I was, I was into like, I don't know, I guess I was kind of like nihilist, you know? Um, I was into like some bad, getting into like some bad political ideologies and uh, kind of like just, I, I was in an art school. I got a scholarship to go to art school. I was going to become an artist and the, um, uh, at the center for creative studies in Detroit, which was a prestigious art school. Uh, and I was just so depressed. Like I, I started, like, I kind of had this crisis of like, why am I doing anything? Like, why am I getting up out of bed in the morning, putting my feet in my socks, going to this building, like just to do these things, just so I can make some money so I can get some food so I can stay alive to do the whole meaningless routine the next day. You know, when I'm, you know, why the heck does this existence even, why should I keep on going? You know, and I wouldn't say I was suicidal or anything like that, but I was extremely nihilistic about the meaning of life. And I could see no reason why, you know, why, if I, if I like put a gun to my head and blew my brains out, like it wouldn't make any difference in the big scheme of things. You know, there's been so many people that have lived and died and many have barely made a blip on the, you know, in the course of world affairs. And I was just like, I'm completely meaningless. You know, I, I, I felt like a crisis of meaning of was really the problem. So, uh, Anyhow, I was really kind of breaking down, uh, and uh, I couldn't I couldn't keep track of my studies. I'd always been a pretty good student, but I was getting like D's and F's, and I was spending time like doing things like uh, I'd leave my house in the morning, and sometimes I wouldn't even go to college. My parents would think I was going to college, but I'd just park my car in the cemetery and go to sleep, you know. Oh. Or I'd just when I'd go to college, I'd just drop class and I'd go sit outside. Like I just there was this like courtyard I used to sit in. I'd just sit there and like kind of brood, you know? So I was very like non-functional, right? Um, very re re a recluse. And um, anyhow, so um, I, uh, I reconnected with my buddy from high school, John, one day. And, you know, I remember we were, um, we were, I had him over to my apartment and we were playing guitar and I just started sobbing, you know? And uh, he was like, what's wrong? And I just, I didn't know how to explain what was wrong, you know? And then, um, he asked, uh, can I pray for you? You know? And I said, yes. And he, he put his hands on me and he prayed for me and he prayed for me to be delivered from, he, he said like, whatever evil spirit is oppressing you, yeah, yeah. you know, I pray for you to be delivered. And something happened where I felt like, I felt like I lost like 10 pounds, like, wow. He prayed. He was like, you know, he was he was Pentecostal. So he was yeah, like, yeah. in G in Jesus name, like <laughs> by the power of the blood of Jesus, you know, he's putting his hands on me and something like lifted off of me, you know, like I felt like like it was so amazing. I, I started like crying, but for happiness. And yeah, when yeah, when yeah. I when I got up, like I actually jumped in the air like multiple times because I felt like I felt like I was on like lunar gravity, you know, because <laughs> of whatever was oppressing me was gone. And I was so happy, um, but I didn't really convert because I didn't see this as like a, as a, um, metanoia, you know, I, I didn't see it as a turning point. I saw it as yeah, like, yeah. I, I, you know, kind of like when you find 20 bucks in your pocket that you didn't know you had, you know, it's just a cool thing that happened to you once, you know? So I didn't yet see it as a full change of life. I kind of went, you know, I was a little happier, but I still didn't have any commitment or, resolution to do anything. And then it was, uh, it was just a matter of time before I kind of like sunk back down into being depressed again. But this time I kind of had, I was now I was wrestling with this. Like I could feel that like Jesus was kind of like tugging at me. Like I could feel him drawing me, but I was kind of like resisting it. Like I wasn't yielding to it. So 
I was trying to like distract myself with social things and whatnot. So one day I went to a, I went to a party. This was about eight months after the experience I just mentioned. Uh, I went to a party and all my old friends from high school were there. And it was such a depressing party. Everybody was like drunk. Uh, everybody was like uh, just in a very bad spot. You know, the the whole youthful joy that we'd had when we were yeah, like 14, yeah. 15 was gone. You know, as like the the dreary long years of adulthood had set on and everybody was just like at bad spots and they're <laughs> yeah. 19, 20 years old and they're all doing substance abuse and and drunk and like there's a lot of drama. And I was just like, man, this is depressing, you know. And uh, and my friend John was there and and uh, John had had a very profound kind of you know, transformation over the years. And he was just there annoying everybody at the party witnessing to Christ, you <laughs> yes. know, like people would just be at the party being like, yeah, man. Uh, and he'd be like, what you need is Jesus, you know, like, <laughs> and he's John. just like going and, and everybody's kind of pissed at him. They're like, yeah. like people are murmuring, like somebody should throw him out. Like he's just <laughs> annoying everybody, you know? And I heard him, I heard him like witnessing to some other guy he was like, yeah, you know, the problem is you need Jesus Christ. And every time he said the name Jesus Christ, it was like something pulled me, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. And he was trying to talk this guy into converting. Um, very, um, uh, very like aggressively. Um, so, and I was just listening. He wasn't even talking to me. I was just kind of listening to talk to someone else. And the other guy blew him off. And then he kind of went away and then I turned to John and I kind of grabbed him by the arm and I said, I want that, you know, wow. and <laughs> at this time I felt myself, um, uh, I felt myself like kind of ready to fold. Right. And, uh, I said, I want that. And he was like, you really want this? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, well, let's go. I'm going to go baptize you then. <laughs> oh, so, um, wow. cause that was the way they do it, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. and I, at this time I didn't even know I'd been baptized as a child. I thought I was unbaptized because my upbringing was so nothing, you know? So we left the party and, uh, we drove to his house to get some towels. And then we went to the lake, <laughs> to the local lake. This was, uh, October 22nd, 1999. Uh, it was very cold. It was a cold autumn. I remember it was like so cold, you know it, because you're from the same area I am. It's like where it's very blustery, but the snow hasn't fallen yet, but it's about yeah, to fall yeah, any minute, yeah. you know. Um, so took me to the lake and uh, we just I went down to the water fully clothed. You know, it was a desolate spot in the lake. This was like the lake by where we all grew up. He took me out into the water and uh, he dunked me like full immersion, you know, and he said, uh, Philip, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. And he dunked me in the water. And when I came out of the water, uh, I, I palpably felt extraordinarily different. Uh, like, I can't even explain it. I, I walked up to the shore and I started shouting like jubilation. You know, I was like holding my <laughs> arms up and I was shouting. I was just sh sh like, ah, you know, and I was like, I, I felt like uh, the best way I can describe it is I felt like uh I felt like Adam on the first moment of his creation, you know, like I felt like I'd just been born into the world wow. and I was looking at everything. I remember looking at the trees and the the sky and the water, and it looked like I was looking at it all for the first time, you know, and um, I kind of understood the phrase born again, you know, because I felt like I'd made a definitive break. Um, so anyhow... I was so happy. And now there was like no doubt. I felt like I'd been completely knocked. You know, it was like a Paul on the road to Damascus moment, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so I went home and I went to bed. And then when I, I, I woke up in the morning and I still felt different. You know, I was, I was not sure what would happen when I woke up, but I woke up and I still felt different. And I was just like, I'm a, I'm a Christian now, you know? So that was my initial step. Um, that was my first, that was my baby step. <laughs> you know, towards yielding to, uh, to Jesus. Yeah. Well, we can stop right there for a minute because I have yeah. some, I'm taking some notes furiously. I got to sure. say, Philip, you didn't know my story and I didn't know your story. There are a lot of shocking similarities in both of our stories. Uh, oh, wow. I, I did the new age thing for a bit. I, 
I, I, I think you convert you can became you know Christian I think a year before me, which is kind of funny. So oh, cool. I remember trying to I, I tried to become like New Age, like Wicked, and I went on the internet, uh, you know, back in those days before Google or anything, and I I tried Googling like Wiccan or something, and I I think I didn't become like a witch. I couldn't figure out how to find anything on the internet. Like I couldn't yeah, find yeah, the yeah. information. So <laughs> it was it was a lack of good resources that stopped me from becoming some you. kind of yeah, oh New thank age. God no dude I remember. Hilarious. Going to the, I remember going to the physical library and like checking out their witchcraft yes, books and stuff. Yes. You know, oh man, that's cool. That's yeah. I don't. We know nothing about each other's stories, so uh, it. I like the similarities. Um, it's cool yeah. how God draws people in a similar way. But I think yeah, I think that's amazing. And actually, it was a party. This is my my grade nine year. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so 2000, 2000 was the was this year for me, uh, at, at like a you know a, par a party uh, with all the band nerds from from high school, and it was at that party that I met th this first guy who was he was a Wiccan, and he was talking in ways that I hadn't heard anyone talk before about there's more out there to the world than just us. There's we're all connected. We're mm -hmm. and here I am a very insular selfish you know, young person i hadn't thought of that before i hadn't thought yeah. there's more than just me in the world and you no. know so so he opened my eyes i i tried to figure out what he was and how to be like him and i couldn't find yeah. anything and so i went to my my best friend growing up who was an evangelical christian and asked i said to him hey does does god like connect with this kind of stuff like is this like does this sound like something that that you can explain to me and it was from kind of his evangelization that i then became uh, Christian. Oh wow! Uh, he saved you from the other. Uh, yeah. Yes, wow. yes. In in a fairly dramatic, like like oh, you know, in the middle of getting getting into a fight with these guys who I had bullied in elementary school. In you know, we were in the punk rock scene, and we're all these tough guys. I was I'm, too. <laughs> I'm ready to get my clock cleaned by this guy, uh, and this kind of miraculous uh, event happened that saved me from being beat up. And that was kind of the linchpin like okay oh my gosh god you, you still love me you still care i can i can be a christian and follow you so mm. i just see these these beautiful overlaps in, in our two yeah our two i was stories. i was in that punk rock scene too <laughs> like when i uh when i converted i was like or when i was first going through this i remember i had like uh i had like a mohawk and i was like yeah. you know <laughs> i wore combat boots and you know i was very like uh, i kind of relished that look you know um but at any rate, I woke up the next morning. I kind of realized I was a Christian and there was no <laughs> doubt about it. And I like had that sense of like throwing away everything to to follow him. It would take a lot for me to understand what that meant. And I'm still learning it, you know, over the years. And that's one thing I love about the faith is there's always like greater levels of understanding that you go to. But um, uh, in retrospect, I really appreciate my friends. Just he was just like, you need Jesus Christ. Like he, like he wasn't trying to like mince words or beat around the bush or spare my feelings. Yeah, you know, yeah. he was just like, you need Christ. And, and that resonated with me because there was, as they're fond of saying in, uh, in the Pentecostal circles, there was power in the name, you know? Um, and it, <laughs> yeah. it resonated like whenever the name was spoken, even before I believed it kind of shook me in a way, like it jarred me a little bit. There was like a discomfort, but also, a uh, like a, uh, it would kind of shake me, but it would also draw me simultaneously. Um, but anyhow, uh, I remember the first few, the first year of being Christian, and I, I threw myself into it pretty wholeheartedly. Um, I, I got a copy of the Bible. Uh, it was like a Gideon's copy from a hotel room, you know, and I read the whole, I read the whole <laughs> thing. I started at Genesis and I read the whole thing through, and then I read it again. I annotated the whole thing. I made flashcards. I spent my spare time memorizing yeah. the Bible verses. And, um, you know, but I didn't realize at the time, I, I remember watching, I remember I went and rented Jesus of Nazareth, the miniseries from the library, and I just sat there and cried watching it, you know, wow. because it, it suddenly yeah. resonated with me. Yeah. Whereas I'd yeah. seen it before growing up and I was just like, what is this? And then now it like, it resonated with me deeply, you know, but, um, I didn't really know what living as a Christian meant. I remember calling my mom to the table and having the Bible open and being like, I'm a Christian now. And, you know, this says that I need to like make peace with people. And so I'm sorry for all the trouble I caused. And I just kind of apologized <laughs> for being a bad kid. And she was like, okay. You know, like, I think she thought it was, it was fake at first, you know, but, uh, you know, we really don't often think when we convert about, 
um, the context we convert in and how that affects things. So yeah. I was like a spiritual child of my friend. So I took on whatever he, you know, proposed as what Christianity was. And he was kind of like came from a very low church yeah. Pentecostal yeah. movement where like church was in people's houses, you know, um, or, or where there was a great skepticism about denominations, you know? So, um, uh, so kind of like, basically I, I kind of learned about Christianity outside the confines of specific churches. I remember like I'd go to a Presbyterian church to check it out, or I went to the assemblies of God, but like we very much were skeptical of like any like institutional church. So we had this kind of idea that like the real church was among like, you know, uh, poor people or like people who don't have worldly recognition. So we kind of traveled around chasing different teachers. Uh, um, very early on, we went to a house where, um, there was like a lady that was a prophet. And for those of you yeah, listening yeah. on podcast, I'm doing air quotes. Um, <laughs> And we would go to her basement, you know, and she just had a basement and there'd be chairs set up and there was like 20 people that would come and we'd just listen to music and, and sing. And then she'd like preach and then she'd deliver a prophecy and then she'd speak in tongues and, yep, yep. you know, and so it was that sort of stuff. And then I remember we went to this trailer where there were these two guys uh, that would deliver expositions on the Bible and they were very esoteric. They were very much mystical. They, even though they weren't Catholic, they'd been reading like they'd been reading like quietist literature and like uh, kind of like practicing the presence of God. And they were very much into the mystical end of things. And so I picked up some of that and I, I picked up a little, I remember one time my friend took me down to a, you know, to a, an all black church in Detroit um, where we kind of had this idea that like, the, like I said, the real church was among the poor. So we went down to like a very poor neighborhood in Detroit and went to like a all black church, the kind of church where it's like held in the gymnasium of a condemned school, you know, and uh, where the pastor is named Bishop so-and-so, you know, <laughs> yeah, and, yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, and there was lots of like spiritual manifestations of things. I remember those early years, it seemed like it seemed like God was physically manifesting himself to me in many ways. There was miraculous things I saw that I don't understand to this day. Um, I witnessed miraculous things. I, uh, I, uh, I had very childlike faith. Uh, you know, I remember, I remember I was told, you know, reading in the Bible that if you just fasted and prayed that like things would happen. I remember somebody had a very, you know, a very, um, serious medical condition. And I was just like, well, the Bible says I should fast about this. And I fasted for three days and then he was healed from his condition. Yeah. And he didn't, he didn't know I was fasting from him on the third day. He called me and said that he went to the doctor and they said that his condition had inexplicably, uh, vanished, you know, wow. after I'd been fasting <laughs> for three days. So I just had this very like childlike, uh, faith and, uh, you know, I'm not saying that to make myself sound like I'm a prayer guru. Like I didn't even know what I was doing. You know, <laughs> I was just like the book says I should do this, so I did. You know, um, and uh, and I, I had, you know, I saw lots of spiritual things, and it seemed like God was a living, real thing that was around me all the time. You know, I felt very ensconced in the divine presence, but I really had a trouble with the sort of like Pentecostal worship. Uh, eventually I started going to a church that was, it was a church, but it was a very low churchy church, you know? Um, uh, and it was kind of like a church for people who could barely tolerate church. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on speaking in tongues, you know, and this was an experience I never had. And it started to frustrate me because my other Pentecostal friends were telling me I needed to have this experience. And, uh, there, like when I went to that black church in Detroit, the pastor straight up told me like, you're not saved if you don't yes, speak in tongues, yes, you know, yeah. they were, uh, they were, for those of you who have a Protestant background or no Pentecostal stuff, this was a church that was Jesus only with evidence of speaking in tongues, you know, yeah, so be baptized yeah. in the name of Christ, not in the Trinity oh, with evidence of speaking yeah. in tongues or you're not saved. Yeah. And they, uh, and I remember it was very kind of cultish. I went there a couple weeks and, uh, I remember after the service was over, they would gather around me in a circle 
and they would kind of interrogate me with questions. And then the, the pastor kind of convinced me that I need to be baptized again, which at this point, this would have been a third baptism because <laughs> I didn't know about my first one, you know? Uh, and uh, they talked me into being baptized another time because he said, well, whatever your friend did in the lake, that doesn't count because you didn't speak in tongues. So wow, yeah, they, uh, yeah. they they baptized me in, uh, you know, in this tank, in this church church. Uh, you know, this auditorium thing uh, or a uh, cafeteria of an old school. <laughs> and, uh, and then immediately after they baptized me in the name of Jesus Christ, they took me into this back room and they put me in a chair and then they all got in a circle around me in the chair and they told me it was time to speak in tongues. And then they all started just speaking in tongues around me, like just, and then there was a lady behind me who would put her hand on my shoulder and she was like, now you do it, you know? And I was like, oh, I can't, you know? And they just kind of get louder, like, oh, da, 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 you know, and then when they yeah, saw I wasn't yeah, doing it, they yeah. just get louder and louder and louder, you know, and this went on for like 20 minutes and it was very, very uh, uncomfortable because um, uh, and then after 20 minutes, the pastor came out and called it off. Um, he was like an elderly African-American gentleman, very large, very imposing. He was over six feet tall, probably 65 years old. He had like suspenders on, you know, a little <laughs> bow tie. And he's like, and after they call off, he's like, you in my office, you know, like I was a kid getting in trouble <laughs> and he took me in his office. I'll never forget. He sits down in like this old leather chair that rocks back and he's like, Ring! and he's got like pulls a cloth out and he's like mopping the sweat off his neck and forehead, you know, and he says, what's the problem here, son? You know, and I, I said, what do you mean? And he's, he's like, what's the problem? You know why? What's holding you back? And I said, I don't know. It's just not coming. You know, and he's like, you're thinking about it too hard. And I was like, no, I'm just like, I want this to be authentic. I'm not going to just start talking on my own. If this is from the Holy Spirit, then, you know, I'm not going to dare just start. Do he was basically telling me you need to just do it, you know? Sure. Yeah. yeah. And I, I said, no, like if this is from the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit needs to take control of my mouth and make it come out, you know? And uh, he kind of shook his head in, in disgust, you know? And he's like, he said... He pointed at me and he's like mopping the sweat off his brow. And he's like, you're letting the devil steal your gift. <sighs> and, uh, and so then I left and I was very, I was, uh, it was the first time that I felt like, um, I'd been abused by someone in spiritual authority, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I had that strong, like the best way I can describe it is feeling yucky, you know, uh, like feeling, uh, like, uh, like I'd just been kind of like brutalized or abused, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I left. I never went back to that place, but it really brought this question of, of tongues to the fore. And uh, I did, I started doing some real in-depth Bible studies on this. And this was what brought me into the realization that there were many different interpretations of what Christianity was. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I started reading like, oh, well, you know, there's, and, and, uh, and this was, this was largely bound up with like, uh, and you remember how it is in like, especially in nineties evangelical Pentecostalism, there's a heavy eschatological apocalypticism yeah. uh, with it all. So I started reading about various approaches to tongues, and then I'd be like, well, but the post-trib pre-mill people say this, and then the the the, the pre-mill, a mill, post-trib, you know, and I'm like, what? And then and then I'd get, you know, and then I found out there was a whole debate about the rapture, which I yeah. had just yeah. I had just believed in implicitly <laughs> because my friend believed in the rapture. And then I started like, what? And I, I started realizing that the Bible doesn't really interpret itself. Like, if you think it interprets itself, you really haven't gotten out of a certain context yet, where you often look at a verse, especially if you're just kind of come into a certain tradition, where you just take the verse to mean that because that's what Christianity tells you it means, yeah. or whatever Christian denomination you are in, you know? So when it says in... Um, in Acts 2, you know, 232, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. You know, I had been told what that meant in a Pentecostal context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it never hit me that there was other interpretations to that. So this question, now I came to, I came to kind of like reject the whole idea that you need to speak in tongues. Um, and, but this problem of D divergent interpretations really started to bother me, you know, like kind of trying to understand what does this book actually say, you know? So I started going to a church. I was going to like a church that I would describe as Pentecostal, but not very hardcore. Like if you didn't speak in tongues, they didn't bother you about it. 
you know, um, it was kind of, I guess we just call it today. I, you and I would think of it as an evangelical church with like a charismatic flavor, you know, <laughs> yeah. Bapticostal, um, we called it. <laughs> what did you call it? Bapticostal. Yes. Yes. It had the, uh, <laughs> it, it, it had the, uh, the ambiance of a Baptist church. It was, it was a formal church structured. The pastor wore like a suit and tie, yeah. you know, the altar looked like a, a stage and he'd walk around and sweat and he would preach and he would kind of do that, <laughs> that, uh, that cadence where he'd be like, uh, he was from the South. I'm from Michigan, but this guy had come from somewhere from Carolina or something, you know, and he, you know, he'd do that thing where he'd be like, Jesus says that you need to repent of your sins. You know, he'd kind of have that cadence to it, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and, uh, and people would be in the, you know, like, mm -hmm, amen, you know, like that. And then like, they'd, they'd play music and they'd speak in tongues and people would be slain in the spirit and, you know, whatever. But then if you didn't want to do that, you didn't have to. So yeah, okay. I felt very like comfortable there. Um, and I really wanted to serve Jesus deeply because, you know, he'd made, I felt like, you know, and it's true. He saved me from whatever, wherever I was at. I felt, I really felt profoundly what it meant to be saved. And honestly, you know, Sometimes I, uh, sometimes I don't know if you're just raised with the faith. It's a different experience. Like I, I kind of wish in retrospect, I often meet kid. like I work in homeschooling right now and I, I meet families and kids who are just raised with the faith. And sometimes I'm envious of that, you know, that they were raised in that environment and never had to go through what I went through. And then other times I'm like, sometimes I meet people and I'm like, I don't know if you have the um, like the cognizance of what it means to be saved, you know, yeah, like to, yeah. to be like on the yeah. road to destruction. And then Jesus, for no reason other than his own overflowing goodness, comes and scoops you up yeah. and brushes you off and says, no, I've got something else for you. That's that's something that every every sin I ever committed and every darkness I ever walked through um it was worth it for me to have been picked up. And I'm not saying that, you know, that justifies the sins, but I'm saying what our Easter liturgy says, that it's a happy fault, you know, like, uh, because I walked through that darkness, I was able, to, you know, he who is forgiven much loves much, right? Um, so I, um, I felt like I really had a profound knowledge of what it meant to be forgiven. And I wanted to give that back. I, I kind of had no doubt that I wanted to serve him. So in this church I was in, I went and I signed up for a um, a program to train to become a um, to basically become a minister in that denomination. By this time, I'm like in my early 20s, you know. And uh, he had a leadership class. Now this was plugged in. This was not a denomination, but it was plugged into some like federation of churches or whatever. You know how how they often are in that <laughs> that world. Um, so I was going to basically train to go to places and found churches, you know, to like go to other states or wherever other countries and found like house, found little churches, start yeah, congregations. Yeah. What do they call a, a church planter is what they yeah, call them in, yeah. in Pentecostalism, you know? So I signed up for this leadership class. And by this time I had started to discover Catholicism uh, through another friend that I met. I, I met this, this uh, other guy who was a very zealous Christian and he was Catholic. And it was really kind of like shocking to me because I'd only ever met, the only serious Christians I'd met were like evangelicals and Pentecostals. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was very suspicious of denominations and I viewed Catholicism as a denomination. And I viewed it as like the most stodgy denomination, you know, like the most stuck uh, <laughs> yeah. kind of like legalistic backwards boy putting the, putting the cart before the horse denomination there was. And I was very kind of like, oh, you're Catholic, huh? You know, like, but I was surprised that this fellow like loved Jesus, you know? And not only that, but like he had very good answers for things that I said to him, you know, when I was like, well, you know, the Bible says this and he'd be like, well, yeah, but it says this too. And I was like, hmm, you know, <laughs> um, and there was some verses that he would point out to me that I just never even noticed, you know, like I'd, I'd really, I'd really, as an evangelical or Pentecostal, I'd really, you know, been deep in the book of Romans and, uh, been deep in like, you know, if, if we first John, if we are faithful to confess our sins, then, you know, we, we have confidence that we've been forgiven. But then he pointed out things to me like the gospel of John, you, you know, the end of the book, like whosoever sins you forgive are forgiven, whosoever you retain are retained. Or, uh, you know, um, 
or like the the letter to St. James, uh, if any, you know, no one is justified by faith alone, but, <laughs> but by faith and works. And I started, I started to notice these things and I was like, what? Like, and I had kind of read them before, like I'd read the Bible multiple times. But like I said, when you're reading only through a certain denomination, it's like yeah, you get kind yeah. of like you got like a certain colored glasses on where you just don't pick up on these passages. And so he started explaining various things to me and I started reading Catholic content. And, um, you know, I, I remember I got a book by um, Thomas Howard, Evangelical is Not Enough, you know, where I was introduced to the concept of liturgical worship. Um, and this really spoke to me. Because one thing that was troubling me about the worship I was in was its emotionalism. Uh, because, uh, you know, it was always, all the churches I'd been to, it was always like, kind of like, you know, like, uh, for those of you listening, I'm waving my hands and clapping. <laughs> um, it was it was very emotional. Yeah, it was very yeah. like, and even though I wasn't speaking in tongues, it was still presumed that this was going to be a highly emotionally charged thing. Like people would regularly weep. And I was just kind of like, I don't always feel that way, you know, and I'm not going to fake it. I'm not going to pretend that I'm like weeping and sobbing when I don't feel that way because I was very sincere about this. But it was also bothering me uh, like the, the in, I was also kind of seeing that Pentecostalism is not intellectual, um, not saying that Pentecostals can't be intellectual or that they're dumb. But what I'm saying is they don't take a rational, a, like a rationalist yeah, or intellectual yeah, approach yeah. to the faith. They're not interested in theology in a systematic sense. In, um, you know, I would listen to Benny Hen tapes where he'd just be like, uh, I'm going to tell you about the book of Zephaniah. And then he would be like, he'd just say a verse and then he'd be like, what this means is, and he'd just have some freely invented thing <laughs> that he's like, God, yeah, showed, yeah, God yeah. showed me what this passage means. And I'm just, and like, as I was growing in the faith, I was like, this is literally insane. Like, everybody is just saying what they think it means, yeah. you know? So um, when I read Thomas Howard's book, Evangelical is Not Enough, and I don't even know if he was Catholic at that point when he wrote that book. But Not originally, no, no. Yeah, I think it was Anglican or something. He added, a, he but, added an afterward after he published it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it introduced me to liturgical worship, and I was like, this is what I'm missing because... Yeah. This like doesn't make it about my emotions, you know, and so I and I really started. So I started reading other Catholic books. I read a couple apologetical works. I remember I read Catholicism and Fundamentalism by Carl Keating. I read uh, Mark Shea's um, By What Authority. I read um, I read kind of like the pop Catholic answers books, you know, yeah. uh, which yeah. served their which served their purpose. You know, I read um, I read Patrick Madrid's Any Friend of God is a Friend of Mine you know, on the intercession of the saints. And these things started to make sense to me. And I really appreciated and resonated with the intellectual consistency in Catholicism, with the fact that there was like what you and I would now call like a systematic theology, yeah, right? Yeah. Where they're trying to like make a sense of the hierarchy of truths. But I was just very like against Catholicism in principle, you know, even though there were things about it that made sense, I was just very against it. And a couple things changed my perspective. Um, and they were very, uh, very emotional things, ironically, because I'm talking about the intellectual aspect, yeah. but like God drew me in a very emotional way. Yeah. And wow. one thing that happened that was of profound importance, and I will never cease being moved talking about this, um, was I, uh, I discovered St. Francis of Assisi. And um, my my friend John, who was the one that converted me, he he was like affiliated with the Jesus people. I don't know if you know what yeah, that is. Yeah, yeah. But they're like, for those of us you don't know out there, they're like kind of like hippie Christians who live in like little communes around the country in the inner cities, and they run like food banks and stuff like that, you know. And uh, he had gone to the Jesus people uh, in Chicago, and he'd gone to California. And when he was in California, he had come across the movie Brother, Son, Sister Moon by Franco Zeffirelli, uh, a 1971 or 73 movie about the life of St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, it's very dated in some respects. It's got a uh, soundtrack by Donovan <laughs> and it has uh, and it re it represent it, 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 it reflects a very like 1970s ish take on Francis. 
but it gets the basic story of his life right. And it was filmed right in Assisi. And uh, the character, they got to play Francis to this day. I think he reflects Francis as I envision him most. Yeah. And he brought back this movie and he was like, you got to watch this. And uh, I watched this movie and it just resonated with me so deeply. Um, just seeing that this experience that I had was not just something that I was having, that my friends had, but that many people throughout history had had. And it hit me so hard. Like the movie shows Francis like partying, you know, with his friends and drinking and then having his conversion. And then, you know, uh, and the scene where he takes his clothes off in the square <laughs> when he's like having his confrontation with his dad. So I met St. Francis and uh, I was just like, I was like, this is the most powerful thing I've ever seen, you know, and I wanted what Francis had. And I started checking out books from the library about Francis of Assisi and reading everything I could about him. I read biographies of him. I, I got a copy of his The Little Flowers of St. Francis. I read his biography by Bonaventure. And I, I couldn't square how how Catholicism produced this person, you know? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. And um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm starting to cry. <laughs> um, I, I just fell in absolute love with him. And there was times when I wanted to emulate him too. Like I remember, I remember walking around town barefoot, you know, with my Bible <laughs> in the rain, you know, and just like talking to random people at the gas station about Jesus, you know, or, uh, my, my, a couple buddies of mine who, who also like St. Francis, we went into the woods and we built a little hut and we were like going to live in the hut. And like my, and I remember our parent, my parents came out there and they were like, you are in, I dropped out of college, you know, like, I, I dropped out of college because I couldn't focus on any of it. And my parents were very alarmed because like I was going to this prestigious art school and then I dropped out and now I'm like, I'm going to, and now I'm walking around barefoot with a Bible. I'm like, I'm going to live in the woods. <laughs> and they were very alarmed. But uh, St. Francis, like I believe that Jesus gave me St. Francis to speak to my personality, you know? And, uh, but the second, so, but anyhow, like, I still didn't want to yield to this because I just, there was a couple things I couldn't get over, you know, uh, I couldn't get over like apostolic succession, you know, because I'd come to understand a uh, various truths about the faith, but I couldn't, un I couldn't accept that that authority had been passed down through the bishops and was still existing in the Catholic church to this day. Um, I just couldn't accept that. And I kind of realized that if I kept digging, I was just going to have to become Catholic, you know, and I didn't want to because it still wasn't a thing I wanted. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to put all this stuff on the shelf for now. I've been really researching this for months. I need to just chill out. I'm going to focus on my leadership class on training for the ministry. And, uh, and so, uh, I focused on that and, um, and I was doing the ministry class and my Catholic friend was like, hey, are you, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't know, man, I'm just confused by all this. He was like, why don't you just come to RCIA and you can just ask questions, you know? So I went to RCIA and I was lucky, man, knowing how RCIA is in many places. I like walked into a good parish where the RCIA guy was solid. <laughs> and you know who one of my, you know, who one of my teachers was? One of my, one, the RCI, there was a team of RCI teachers. One of the people who taught me was the secretary of servant of God, John Harden, um, who's, I don't know if you know who he is. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's wow. servant of God, John Harden. Now this was his personal <laughs> secretary who had like, wow. who had edited his prayer books and writings wow. and stuff. That was one of my teachers. Amazing. Um, yeah. And another, so I, I was very lucky to have a good RCI experience and anyhow, um, somehow through the gossip vine, it got back to my Protestant pastor that I was going to RCIA. And so I was training in this class. So basically right now I'm walking in two worlds, you know, um, and I'm just trying to learn. And, uh, my pastor was training me to give a sermon. Like he was going to let me stand up in front of the congregation and give a sermon. And, uh, he called me over one day and he's like, Philip, tell me about this church you've been going to on Wednesday nights. You know, that was when our CIA was. Uh, and I'm like, well, it's a, it's a Catholic church. And he's like, mm-hmm. 
He's like, and he's like, are you, are you attending there? And I'm like, no, I'm not attending. You know, I'm like, I'm going through RCIA basically, uh, to just learn about it. And he's like, I just have one question for you. Just one question. He said, he said, Holy communion, the communion wafer and the, the wine. Do you believe that is the body and blood of Jesus Christ? And I said, uh, I, I just kind of hesitated. And I said, yes, sir, I do. And he said, can you point to me one passage in the Bible where that is taught? And I really panicked uh, because this guy was so imposing. You know, he, like I said, he was a big guy. He had the Southern accent, you know, he'd been preaching his whole life. I was so intimidated by him. I was like, uh, and I stammered. And he goes, he goes, mm hmm, that's what I thought. <laughs> and then he just goes, you will not be preaching this month. And he told me I could stay in the class, but he said I would not be preaching. So I was like, I was very, like, un, you know, I was bummed. Yeah. So, um, so anyhow, uh, so I'm still going through the class and, uh, I had started to kind of pop in at daily mass, you know, in my hometown. And, uh, at first I didn't even, at first I went to a church that wasn't even Catholic. <laughs> there was a, there was a church in my town called the charismatic Episcopal church, which was an Episcopal church that build itself as charismatic also. And they had valid holy orders through a schismatic bishop in Brazil. And I thought it was Catholic because they said they were Catholic. Like I'd ask them, are you Catholic? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was going to mass there. And then one day I asked the, pre I was like, are you Catholic? And he was like, well, yeah, but not like Roman Catholic, you know? Oh, no. And I was like, okay, you're not Catholic, <laughs> you know? So then I finally figured out where the real Catholic parish was in my town and I was going to it. And it was just your boring, like Novus Ordo daily mass, Eucharistic prayer number two, only old people in the congregation, you know? It was what like trad Catholics today would be like, this is like the most bore, like worst <laughs> liturgy, you know? <laughs> but I was sitting there, I was like, this is amazing, yes. you know? Yes. Because they, just because there was structure because that's what there wasn't where I was coming from. There was no yeah. structure at yeah. all. So I was like, oh my gosh, they have readings. Like, oh, they say the same prayers every week. You know, even though it was like the Eucharistic prayer number two and just, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I was just like, wow, like this is amazing. So at any rate, um, two other things happened on my way to Catholicism. Uh, one of them was uh, I was... Um, you know, I was really struggling about this issue with the real presence. Uh, not that I didn't believe it, but that I couldn't explain it to this pastor. It really bothered me that I had choked up. So one day I was at like a Wednesday uh, or a, a Wednesday night uh, service at praise and worship service. And I just wasn't feeling it. My heart was so heavy from all these things. And I remember it was raining very hard outside. And um, this was like not a very rich church, so they didn't have air conditioning. So it was like super hot and muggy in the church. And I was so hot. I was like, I'm going to just go out and take a walk. So I just left the service and I started walking around the church grounds in the rain. I was getting rained on. It was like thunderstorming very hard, you know, and I was just getting wet and I didn't care because St. Francis used to get wet. And I was like, <laughs> you know, it's like imitating him, you know. So I walked around. I was walking around the church, just mulling over this question of the Eucharist and I turned the corner of the church and it was the darndest thing. As I turned the corner of the church, this was nighttime. It was dark and it was raining. And I turned the corner of the church and, uh, and I saw floating in the air in front of me, there was a, a Eucharistic uh, chalice with the host above it, you know? Oh, and it was like floating in the air. And it was like, it was like five feet tall. It was like as big as a person, you know? And I can't explain how I saw it. Like it, it wasn't like, it wasn't like an apparition, like it was physically there, like, but it was there, like in my mind's eye, absolutely. I, it stopped me dead in my tracks. Like it was like I walked into a wall when I wow. came around the corner, I was just yeah, hit yeah. with it and it was floating. I remember what side of the building it was on. You know, it was on the north side of the building, 10 feet away from the corner, floating one foot off the ground. And it was like five feet tall. And I just saw it on whatever plane of existence I was looking at it on. And it dropped me to my knees instantly. Like I felt wow. like I walked into an energy field and I just dropped to my knees in the mud instantly. And I like held my, my hands out like this, you know, and I was getting, I was getting rained on like Andy Dufresne breaking out of <laughs> Shaw Shawshank prison, you know? 
And I just sat, I sat there and I was like, it was like, Ador like, you know, from my perspective, this was the first time I was at adoration, you know, yeah. even though I don't know yeah. what the experience was, you know, and I was, I was just sitting there and I don't even know how long it lasted, but eventually it stopped. And I got up and I was filled with this like exuberance and I ran back into the church. And by that time, the service had ended and the pastor was like greeting people at the front door. And I walked in, and I was covered in mud and I was wet and he was like this. <laughs> and I walked up to him and I was like, and, and I walked up to him and with this supernatural insight, I just walked up to him and I was like, John chapter six, verse 55 through uh, whoever eats the flesh and blood of the son of man has life. And he, you know, and I recited the, the bread of life discourse, like the verse that I'd been looking for <laughs> when he confronted me about it. It yes, was like, yes. it was like infused into my brain, you know? And I was like, I was just telling him and he was blown. He didn't rebut. Now he was the one that didn't say anything. Um, <laughs> partially it was from like my, my eyes were blazing with like insanity, <laughs> yes, you know? Yes. And I was just wet and dripping and I was like rattling off Bible verses about the Holy communion. And he, he like backed up like this and his eyes were open and he goes, uh, he goes, well, all right then, you know, and that was all he had to say. <laughs> so, um, so at any rate, uh, I come back, you know, another, you know, not too long after that to go to the, the lead, the leadership class is about to wrap up and I'm just praying and I'm like, God, like, I believe this, like, I want to, I want to be Catholic, but you need to help me overcome this hurdle about apostolic succession because I don't understand it. And I, I need to know that this is true, you know? And so I went into my leadership class and the pastor uh, put up a PowerPoint on the board and um, the PowerPoint, uh, hold on, I don't want to say the verse wrong. So I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I, I get this verse right. Cause he had a verse on the PowerPoint. Um, hold on, let me look it up. Um, so I was, I was questioning where in the Bible um, I could find apostolic succession um, I have heard me. And as I'm going in there, he pulls up a PowerPoint and the Bible verse, second Timothy two, two is on the PowerPoint. And it says the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses commit to other faithful men who in turn shall be able to teach others as well. <laughs> and it just, it just hit me like a ton of bricks, man. I was like, that's apostolic succession. It, he's saying, St. Paul is saying, I've, I've received something. I'm passing it on to you, Timothy, so that you can teach other faithful men so yeah. that they in turn can teach others. And I was just like, holy cow. And that was like the last card like fell, you know? And I went back to the Catholic church where I was attending RCIA and I was like, I want to come in on Easter, you know? <laughs> and so I told my mom, wow. I went back and told my mom, I'm joining the Catholic church. And my mom was like, well, you're already Catholic. And I was like, what? I was like, what? And she says, yeah, you were baptized. And she's like, look, and she goes in a drawer and she's like, here's your baptism certificate from like July, 1980. Wow. And I was like, are you serious? So I take the baptism certificate back to RCIA and they're like, oh, you don't even need to wait till Easter then. They're like, you, you'll, be con you'll, be, you'll be confirmed on Easter. But they're like, you can just make a general confession and then you can receive communion right away. Wow. And uh, I was like, well, all right. And so <laughs> this, was, uh, this was October. And they said, uh, they said, is there any day you want to do this? You know? And I looked, on the, I looked on the calendar and, uh, you know, um, yeah. it, was like, yeah. it was like the first week of October, you know. And uh, I looked on the calendar and uh, October 4th fell on a Sunday. It was, uh, it was the feast of St. Francis of Assisi, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just, like I said, I'll never not be moved by this. <laughs> it was the feast of St. Francis of Assisi. And um, I was like, you know, that's the day. And so uh, on October 4th, 2002, I, I made a, you know, I made a profession of faith. Uh, on the feast of Francis, and uh, wow. and then I took I took him to be my patron, even though I couldn't be confirmed under his name for until Easter, but I took him as my perpetual patron, and I was admitted to Holy Communion, and uh, then I was confirmed the following you know following spring, so that's that's in a nutshell, <laughs> you know <laughs> what brought me back to the church, and uh, uh, yeah, I get emotional every time I talk about it because it was and and this this was 21 years ago now.
you know, but I think about it like I was, uh, you know, I was going one way and uh, he swooped in and he he scooped me up and set me on another way, you know, and you know how like, um, you know how like if you're in space and like you start going in one direction, you go that direction forever until you get stopped, you know, yeah. <laughs> I kind of think of it that way, like I was traveling on one trajectory through space and then and then, uh, you know, starting way back on October 22nd, 1999, Jesus like reached into my life and touched me and turned me in another direction. And I just think like I'm still going on that trajectory, just like in space, you just keep going. I'm still going that way. And it's very ironic because October 22nd ended up being the feast day of John Paul II, you know, um, which was the night that I first discovered uh, Jesus, you know. So um, later in life, I would start to look back and see, you know, at the time, and I, I know we're over an hour, so I'll try and wrap this up. But at the time, I tended to view it in very like stark terms, like kind of like classical, like I was lost and then I was found. You know, I was in darkness and now I'm in light. I was dead and I'm alive again. And that's certainly true. But as I looked back on it with more mature reflection, I began to see ways that God was always calling me, like even when I thought I was in darkness that he was always there and that uh, Christ had always been guiding me, even though I was wayward. And I started to, to think about experiences I'd had and just things in my life where I could see right back to my earliest memories that he was kind of like moving me in certain ways, you know? And that's just very profound. And I'll never not be grateful for it. And uh, to me, it, you know, and, and I've later read other things like I, I don't really think of it as one conversion anymore. I used to think about like, yes, I was lost. And then on October 22nd, like I like very, very Protestant terms, you know, yeah, yeah. like when were you saved, brother? I was saved on uh, July the 4th, uh, 1979, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. But over time, as I read more Catholic literature, um, you know, like uh, Garigou Lagrange's Three Conversions of the Spiritual Life or various things like that, I began to see conversion more as a process with various milestones along the way that I can pinpoint where important moments happened. But I started to see that my whole life has been one of conversion, that it still yeah. goes on. You know, it's not like I was saved at one time in the past and now that's over, you know. And when you start to see your life as a continuous conversion, then those miraculous things, those powerful moments of grace that I associate with conversion you become more cognizant of them at every stage of your journey, even what we're talking about right this moment, yeah. you know, what's going on. Yeah. You know, it's a continual thing that keeps happening because conversion is nothing other than the turning of the soul towards God, towards the blessed Trinity, you know? And so it's been a tremendous grace. And, uh, and as you can tell, like, I do not view, and I'm sure you feel the same way. I do not feel my past in Pentecostalism as a, uh, I mean, it was erroneous in many regards, but I regard it as an essential step that I took. You know, uh, Pentecostalism saved me from yeah. what I was in before. It introduced me to Jesus Christ. It introduced me to the concept of a transcendent God who acts in your life and who can be depended upon and who you should have faith in. You know, even though many things about Pentecostalism are wrong, um, it gave me, you know, it, it you know, I will, I will never like, I will never poo poo that phase of my life. God used it yeah, to yeah. bring me somewhere, you know? So every, and this is why we have to be patient with people when we're talking to other folks, because like, who am I? Like when I meet somebody who's a Pentecostal or maybe they're even a pagan or they're whatever, like I was there, you know, and I have realized that God was still with me there. Um, he was drawing me and God is drawing that person. And I have to, you know, I can tell them what I know. I can bear my witness, but I I can't be judgmental about where they're at because God used those same things to bring me where I'm at. You know, um, so it's just a marvelous thing. And uh, you know, I don't want people to have to go through all the stuff I went through, but I I do think that people should, you know, if you're a cradle Catholic or you never had that conversion experience, you know, you don't need to convert from something to have the conversion experience. The ultimate conversion experience is that sense of realizing your salvation and letting God draw you where he wants. And anyone can have that, even if you're not coming from Protestantism or whatever. Um, 
and 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 merged with the intellectual tradition of the faith and the liturgy and the mass and everything we have it's such a beautiful home uh, that i'm very thankful for so that's my story in a nutshell um <laughs> in a nutshell i stress <laughs> that's a fantastic nutshell yeah. I love that. I, I have very little to add to this. I have one thought and then I have one kind of maybe question for you. And the thought yeah, is, sure. you know, I, I, I recently encountered a, uh, a, a strain of Christianity that, that sees journeys like ours as us against them. And it's a bit heartbreaking because I, as you say, it's, it's not meant to be that, right? I, and I think it offends some to for me to say, look, I was Pentecostal I, and I became Catholic, as if it's this kind of that against this kind of a yeah. thing, right? I think you're articulating this very well, Philip. That, that I'm, I, I would, I've been trying to lately and put in my mind lately, but it's not, it's not, it's, it's not that to me, yep. and, I, and I never wanted to come across as that. Like it's, no. you know, I. I make little videos about relics and miracles and saints and Mary and put them on and put them on, on Instagram occasionally and podcasts like these and get that kind of feedback that's like, well, well, you know, you're you're wrong on that. Or you're or you're telling us that we're wrong on that, and that's that's we don't like that. But it's a it's a trajectory, I think. Yeah. I, as you said, right? Like, I'm not trying to say, hey, you, you guys are wrong because you don't have you don't believe that the Eucharist is is this. You don't believe the saints do this. I was there, and I feel like. I, th this journey, I, I never thought being that, that yeah. just, that just deepened in my mind, right? I encountered Bible difficulties like, like you did. I encountered Pentecostal ministers who said to me, if you weren't speaking in tongues, you aren't Christian, you aren't saved. I, mm -hmm. I wasn't put down in a chair like, <laughs> like you were. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I was traumatized <laughs> enough. I thought now, now with your story, I'm even more traumatized <laughs> to, to hear that. But I don't think any of those things stop being those things in, in my life, in my mind, in my, in my faith life, those just deepened, I think. And, and when I encountered well, struggles with, right, say John six and began to then read from the early church fathers and read from church history and go, wait a minute, there's, there's other people that believe different things. And I believe I didn't, didn't know those things. And now yeah. as I began to know them, well, God's drawing me into a deeper relationship with him. Not that yes. I was stupid before, Right, but but this is a, a trajectory, right? Yeah, most of us most of us are doing the best we can with the knowledge we have. Yeah. Um, yeah. and if we don't, if if we really believe faith is a gift, that is, it is a grace that God gives us. Now, obviously, you can obstinately close yourself off to faith, or you can you can be culpable for that. But many people are simply believing in good faith, but also ignorance uh, because they just don't know or they don't understand. But uh, if God hasn't revealed or called someone to a certain thing yet, or they haven't had the light to see it yet, then I can't be judgmental about them. Like most people are trying to do the best they can with the information that they have. And, uh, and, and like you said, it is like I reject nothing that was true in Pentecostalism. Like what yeah, I reject yeah. is the false things, you know, yeah. the true things that were in there. And there were true things in there, many true things, you know, um, like if it wasn't for Pentecostalism, like I wouldn't have sat there for hours memorizing Bible passages, yes, yes, which amen. was a good, which was a good <laughs> thing, you know. And uh, so it's not as if the whole thing is in totu false or in totu true. It's like as any other uh, thing that has branched off of Catholicism, it retains elements of truth, as the Second Vatican Council says, but it's mixed with a lot of admixture of erroneous things. And anything that is truly authentic within those traditions, they've only deepened my spirituality um, and, and impelled me towards Catholic unity, you know? Yeah. Um, so I need not reject those things. You know, there's things I do reject, you know, like that guy telling me if I didn't speak yes. in tongues, I wasn't saved. <laughs> yes. But that, that was wasn't terrible. a but that wasn't a thing that built me up and drew me towards God. That yeah. was something yeah. that hindered it, you know. So everything that was authentic and true that I experienced on that journey, I still retain, but now I can see it in its proper context, you know. Um, and that makes yeah. it more rich and makes it more beneficial to me, you know, yeah. uh, because now I'm having, now I'm having it in the, in the context of the family of God, you know, and by the way, since you mentioned, uh, Dr. Scott Hahn, um, his books and his tapes were very instrumental in guiding me along this journey. I used to have his huge cassette booklet thing where you'd open the thing <laughs> yes, and there was like wow. 30, 
30 cassette tapes <laughs> and I was a pizza delivery driver and I'd drive around listening to Scott Hahn's uh, lectures. So he was instrumental in helping open up to me a Catholic understanding of the scriptures that I had been lacking. So I'm eternally grateful to him as well. That's fantastic. You helped put, you helped put his kids through college, it sounds like. So I'm sure he appreciates <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I devoured everything he put out, man. That's amazing. Yeah, the yeah. one the, the one final thought I have this for me this is a, this I think resonates with with your story and kind of bookends this. For me is I can remember when I first became say quote unquote saved. I first experienced I, I think Christ and through my my friend kind of witnessing to me and I okay, I, I want this. I fell to my knees on my face kind mm -hmm. of you know in, in in worship. I didn't know in my in my bedroom, right? As a as a you know a 13 14 year old kid. I didn't know that years and years later I would be as a Catholic going to adoration for the first time with the Blessed Sacrament on the altar and falling to my face in in yeah. the exact same way and I, I didn't know in high school when I did that that, that was an ancient <laughs> prayer position an ancient posture of, of I know prayer. I know I did that just spontaneously and then discovered that and the rich tradition of that, you know, years later <laughs> in adoration. Yeah. And that for me is just this kind of bookends that experience for me that, that kind of kind of sums up what that's been like in that conversion experience yeah. for me. Right. The, you know, I, I grew into that pose. I had no idea it was an ancient prayer position, right? Right. You really thought we were very novel uh, doing yeah. these things. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I remember I remember praying like this, you know, with my arms extended, yep. uh, like standing up and praying this way. And then later seeing um, seeing art from the Roman catacombs, like showing people praying in the the Oran's posture. Yeah, it's like, yeah. OK, this is not something I made up, you know. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, well, Phil, well thanks, this is... <laughs> thanks for letting me share, man. This was good to talk about. That's been a, this has been amazing. Uh, truly uh, God sent uh, Holy Spirit intervention here. Really at the the very last minute. I can't believe this came together. So thank you. Um, that was an awesome story. <laughs> thanks. I'm glad. I, I hope your listeners enjoy it too. And uh, um, can I can I drop how people can uh, look me up online or whatever? Yeah, yes, yes. I was about to ask you. So go, go ahead, good sir. Yeah, sure. So, um, so if you want to check out my writings, uh, I have a professional website, philipcampbell.net. Uh, as Keith mentioned, I've, I've published over, uh, authored over 15 books on various aspects of Catholic history. Um, or you can, uh, you can follow me on Facebook at Philip Campbell author teacher. Uh, and I also blog at unam sanctum catholicum.blogspot.com. You can check me out there as well for uh, articles about history and faith, spirituality, etc. That's that's fantastic. And I have a bunch of your books. Didn't even realize it until I, I you know, I, I first saw your name come across my screen and thought, oh yeah, I know this guy. I've got that's it. highly I've got amusing. I've got his books. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> Listen, yeah. I want to say thank you. God bless you. The work you're doing for the church, uh, and thank you so much for for being here at the very last minute. Just kind of sent in there to uh to be the pinch hitter so thanks so much phil this has been amazing oh you're welcome thanks keith anytime